magic is found in every room where people connect over a shared purpose. In this weekly podcast, Luke, Hannah and Chris explore the role of purpose, courage, mindset and culture in every leader's quest for transformational performance. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Magic in the Room. I'm Luke Freeman. And I'm Hannah Broderud. And we are in the middle of a series on well-being. So we've been talking about what well-being is and why it matters for intentional leaders. Um, And as a reminder, our entire season this, uh, this year, we've been talking about intentional leadership. And there is a free guide available on our website uh, that you can follow along. So if you go to magicintheroom.com, you can download the guide that specifically goes along with our series on well-being, and um, and you can participate in the conversation with us. And I'm really excited for our guest today, Nicole Casey. This is Nicole's first time on our podcast, but Nicole is a not only a longtime friend of the podcast and an avid listener, uh, but she is a really valuable member of our team at Purpose and Performance Group. And so Nicole leads by example and helps our team connect better with our own well-being, uh, reminds us to take better care of ourselves. And um Nicole's practice is is really strong, and that's one of the ways that her leadership shows up on our team and, and for our clients. So I'm just really excited for you, the listeners, to experience the gift that Nicole is. And uh, Nicole, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Luke. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited you're here. And so for listeners, you know, we've been talking all month about well-being. Today we're going to zoom in on self-care. Self-care as a kind of critical component of well-being. And Nicole, I want you to introduce yourself in a second and just like what what should listeners know about you? But also I want to set the stage cuz I'm probably a I don't know, healthy critic or you know like I come to the idea of self-care with some emotional pushback. So tell us why why do you think self-care is important for if we're going to talk about long-term sustained well-being and uh, why is this something that you're passionate about? Tell us a little bit of your story there. Yes. Thank you. I think, um, well, I, you know, my growing up, I was a dancer and dancing for me was always a way of connecting thoughts and my heart um, kind of playing with really what I was most passionate about, what, what brought me most alive. And, um, I did, I danced through, throughout, you know, high school and top dancing and throughout college. And, um, soon after I became a mother and, uh, just really was playing with what is, what is my practice? What am I, you know, I have, you know, three beautiful human beings that I am now um, honored to care for. And through doing that, really noticed that my practices of connecting to myself were abandoned. And um, it was through that desire to be better for them and be better for my partner and show up in my relationships with a lot more authenticity and a lot more just being able to serve them in a higher way that made me really start to evaluate what was happening. And, you know, I had all the excuses, you know, time, I'm exhausted. I can't put something else on my to-do list. There's no way. And um, eventually this inquiry brought me back to, it's a lot simpler simpler than what I, what I thought it was. You know, I, I kept thinking that it was doing more and wasn't necessarily about doing more or less. It was just defining 
what I needed in the moment. Sometimes I needed more and then sometimes I didn't need less. Sometimes I needed to say no and rest. And so I, I, I think it was just a sense of curiosity born out of pure necessity. <laughs> it was, it was, I cannot go on, you know, doing it this way. And through that um, inquiry, I was able to um, start, be on a retreat team. So we, uh, my mentor is an amazing woman, Renee Trudeau, who invited me to assist her at a retreat at Kripalu. And I remember going for the first time and there was such a vast contrast from the life I was living to this experience that I had on at retreat. And over 12 years, I have learned to adopt practices from my retreat space into my day-to-day life. And so I have more opportunity to check in and understand what it is that is needed to serve you know, our clients and to serve my partner and children and my community in a way that is healthy and vibrant. I love that. Um, and that what, what, what I heard there is, you know, that ability to integrate these different parts of your life, that it doesn't have to be all or nothing, but that there can be this kind of, um, and I don't even know if balance is really a thing, but there can be some harmony in the different parts of our lives and we can integrate practices for well-being that don't have to take up necessarily a lot of time and um, but that can be just become a natural part of how we do life. And Luke, you kind of alluded to some maybe emotional baggage around the word self-care. I think it gets a bad rap sometimes. Uh, Nicole, what are your thoughts on like why people sometimes cringe or go, what self-care is dumb? <laughs> why do you yeah, think? Yeah, we've got real work to do around here. I'm not, you can't just sit around, you know, yeah, like listening to bells chime all day or whatever it is that people <laughs> do. Yeah. Right. Eat chocolate and take bubble baths. I have, I don't have time for that. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's multifaceted, but I, while I do think that self-care can be all of those things that you just mentioned, I also, from my own practice, know that it's none of those. It, it is, um, I'm just going to take a deep breath and just try and soak in this time where it's a deeper allegiance to yourself. Self-care, it's not about it doesn't have to be about doing anything. It doesn't have to be about doing a meditation or doing healthy activities or doing. It's really about attuning to what's needed right now. Like, what does the landscape look like? Right? Oh, I have, you know, it, it doesn't mean that I, I just get to sit in meditation all day. Although I do advocate for meditation to get shit done. I just, it's not, you know, it's, it's something that I do because that's what I know I produce better in the long term with, but for other people, it might be taking a walk in nature. And it's, I have this piece that, I mean, and I've, it's been since I was young that how bad do you want to feel good? I'm a feeler and Myers-Briggs feeler full on. So no, like my, I can't every, believe it. My Every action is what can I do in this moment to experience more liveliness, to experience more turn on, more lift, more expansive joy. Um, Even as I'm doing this really hard thing, how can I shift my mindset around it and bring some levity and some playfulness or what is it? What do I need right then? Um, And I know that for me, the harder I crack the whip, the more I contract. I think that's a really interesting you know, point that I've heard you say a few times is that we come to this out of necessity, you know, coming to self-care from a point of how am I, oh, I don't want to use the word productive because I think that's pretty, I don't know, that's a loaded word, 
How am I more effective, maybe? And, you know, that's echoed even in the fact that we're having this conversation. So when we sit down and we say, what is most important for developing intentional leaders? We've got 10 episodes, guys, or 10 months that we're going to talk about intentional leadership. What are the 10 most critical pieces? And when we got down to it and we're talking about sustainability, this idea of well-being, like it had to be in the list. It had to rise into the list because without noticing how we're doing and how sustainable our activity level is, our um, contributions that we're making to the people around us, we're going to flame out. And um, so I guess I'm curious, you know, if we use this model of we notice something as an intentional leader that could be better, we make a conscious choice to do something about it, and then we make a courageous action to actually go and make that change. Um, how how do people or how would you coach someone to notice better how they're doing? Are they on the edge of flaming out, burning out, uh, doing something unhealthy, right? Because they haven't been sustainable. Like, how do we notice that? Yeah. It, or even as you noted, as you mentioned, Nicole, like, when we crack the whip, we contract more. Like, how do we notice when we're contracted or tight or just like not showing up as the most authentic version of us? There's several pieces. Um, the first one I always think of is just being curious. You know, I'm I'm in a deep conversation with my colleagues what is my body how is my body responding you know where are my shoulders where's my breath so when we have that contracted space you'll find that the breath is really really shallow you'll a lot of times we'll feel it on our neck and shoulders we're tight so a lot of times we'll be clenching our shoulders and it's just this idea of opening which is the opposite of that contraction, right? We're giving the heart space and our lungs the space to breathe so that the breath can move all the way down into the belly, into that beautiful creative center so we can oxygenate the whole space. And so just checking in with your breath. Um, a lot of times if I, you know, just from that first, you know, where am I? Like just putting one hand on my heart or one hand on my belly just asking, like closing my eyes for a second. I'm just taking a couple deep breaths and noticing, is my breath shallow? Like, where's my mind? Is my mind, you know, racing with no judgment? We're not judging the breath. We're not, you know, judging the thoughts that are coming into the mind. We're just creating a, an open assessment just being honest with where we are. I think the hardest part with that piece of curiosity is sometimes we're in a place that we don't want to be in. We don't want to have burnout. We have stuff to do. <laughs> we have we have things we have to accomplish. We have to get through Friday. We have to get through, you know, this large project deadline. I can I don't have time to burn out, right? <laughs> and a lot of times, and I never want to say it's too late, but if we're at that point, that means our body's been giving us cues for a long time. We've been getting a tap on the shoulder and we've been saying, no, I don't have time for you. So what are those taps on the shoulder? I mean, how, yeah. how would people notice? Because I don't think people are consciously saying, you know, I don't know. Maybe they are. Like, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think we hundred percent ignore those intentionally. I mean, I'm very good at it. If I have like a big deadline or a big push, I know that the I sometimes I don't notice the signs because I make myself blind to them because I just know that I have to do what I have to do, right? Um, so sometimes it's intentional, but I think often I think if we get used to that, maybe this is maybe just me, but you get so used to ignoring those signs that you then just do become blind to them and you don't notice them anymore. And I think it's a practice, just like we practice 
doing all the things. We practice using our technical skills. We practice using our communication skills. It's just another form of communication. It's just a communication with ourselves. And I think when we are caring and nurturing our spirit, our mind, our emotions, when we are actively participating in that care and feeding of those parts of ourselves, we have more space to hear it. So when we take a walk out in nature and things silence a bit, the things around us are a little more still, we create the space to hear that voice. Um, when we are, you know, experiencing laughter and joy and celebration, we're, we're lifting the energy and the vibration of those things. And a lot of times like that, it will offer the contrast. Oh, our body is yearning for more of that. And the contrast between where we are and where we desire to be. I think so much of it, I think of our intentional change theory that we do with organizations where it's like taking this current state assessment like where am I and being honest like not judging ourselves man I I'm at a two today I'm at a two today and I have a deadline okay how are we going to work together on this to get it accomplished yeah um, or, you know, and knowing that you're a two again, only comes with practice. It's checking in every morning. It's, it's little bitty things that we can do to cultivate better communication with ourselves because our body is giving us signals all the time. That's how we know when we're tired. Um, that's how we know when it's time to wake up. But for so, for many of us, especially if we're wearing multiple hats as we do. Um, that sense of overwhelm can be the louder voice. And um, and it's okay to be with it all. It's okay to be with the overwhelm and notice where we are and get up and shake it out because we have to move through this to have a different experience to get this project done, right? So like, what are the, what are little bitty, you know, nuances that you know that work for you? Yeah. So I just to share personal experience as you a few minutes ago brought our attention to our breath or our shoulders or our belly. I noticed, (laughs) I didn't notice before, but I, you know, I've been in a very intense, period with work where there's been a lot of output, a lot of travel, a lot of go, go, go. And so even just hearing you say, notice your shoulders. I noticed my shoulders were really tense and I was able to relax them, right? You said, notice your breath. And I noticed I was, I was not breathing deeply. I was breathing very shallowly. So I thought it was interesting, just someone else (laughs) guiding you to do this kind of body scan helped me pay more attention to some signals that my body was sending me. And I didn't even realize it. I thought, I mean, I actually was in a pretty good frame of mind when we entered this conversation, right? And yet I was carrying a lot of tension that I wasn't even aware of. We talk a lot about the the body's capacity to hold both, right? We can hold the sense of I'm doing well, I am well, and oh, I do have some of those things. And so it's the noticing that like one's not right or wrong. It's just it's just where we are. And the more we notice, the more we get curious, the more we want to reevaluate what's working, what's not working for me. And I think sometimes, I, I don't know the science on this, you, you'll have to help me, but this idea of just being granted permission 
like, Hannah, I'll sit with you for a minute and let's just do a, a, that body scan real quick. Like I'm granting you permission to do this, just to take two minutes to recognize. And sometimes we just get to moving and then, you know, it's, it's, it becomes a new normal to, to be like this. Mm-hmm. And so someone walks up to you and just places their hands on your shoulders are invites you to place a hand on your heart and say, what, what's your true experience right now? Um, with, with sweet compassion, right. And know that from that place of compassion, your work day, you get to rock it. You know, you'll ride the waves of what comes your way a little bit better. And when the more challenging items come in, you can, stay embodied and just send the breath all the way to the stomach and know that your response to that stimulus could look radically different. Yeah. So I'm going to be the, the ignorant person here. So oftentimes as, as we've had this conversation, you know, you've talked about checking in with your body and then you just use the word embodied. And I think that doesn't, always equate to self-care in in my mind or in other people's minds because I like the examples Hannah gave like sit in the bubble bath and eat chocolate you know for other people it's maybe like sitting and watching a movie or um, going out and having drinks with friends or whatever these things that we do to kind of recharge not be focused not be grinding Um, but as we're talking about what do we do about that you know you keep bringing it back to embodiment but i'm curious you know what is that like when and why is that important like why can't i just go eat chips and watch tv if i'm feeling tired like why why what's this whole checking in thing probably the most challenging thing to explain (laughs) because i'm as the feeler i'm like here let me help you feel it as soon as you feel it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And then, and then you'll be able to articulate it. But for me, embodiment, it means that I have practiced, you know, for me, it's my spirituality and my Nicole-ness. Um, it's me being authentic and able to be present, you know, really in my own, that my spirit has a safe place to be. And that because we've had this dialogue that is kind and gentle, she allows me the space to be curious. And I think when we have that embodied sense, we might say, yeah, the donut for breakfast sounds really good. And for me, the curiosity comes from after I have the donut, I don't feel well. And that's just me. Like I get the sugar, I get antsy, I crash, I get crunchy, I get sharp. (laughs) It just doesn't do well for my spirit. Now I had to try, I had to try those things to find out, oh, I did that. Okay. I ate. And it doesn't have to be a donut, whatever it is. Or, you know, it could be the happy hour. I had two glasses of wine instead of just having one glass. And I didn't want the, I didn't want the evening to stop. And so I lost my embodiment and let's just keep going. Let's have another glass. (laughs) But when you're embodied, I think it's that sacred, um, for me, it's a sacred experience where my mind is connected to my heart and my heart is connected to my gut and they are all moving together. They're dancing in a way that um, I'm able to hear clear messaging about my highest self, about things that will bring me into greater harmony and greater sovereignty with myself. As a recovering thinker who has worked on learning how to more directly access my feelings by actually feeling my feelings and not 
thinking my feelings. <laughs> um, for me, that's been an interesting journey of like, it, it, it is about st- stopping and noticing, right? Getting curious, like saying, how, what am I actually feeling right now and why? And getting curious about where is this coming from? Why am I feeling this way? And just accessing emotion as information, right? Using emotion as information. And that has become, for me, a really helpful filter when I make decisions too. So how do I want to feel at the end of this? Or knowing that if I have two glasses of wine, I'm going to not feel that great. I'm going to feel a little foggy the next morning or definitely. And if I have two glasses of wine, that might lead to a third. And then I'm definitely not going to feel super awesome the next morning. And if I want to wake up with clarity and less brain fog, I can make a different choice, right? Or if I, um, yeah, if I, if I use that, as a stress reliever, for example, like that's something that then I'm going to feel more stress eventually. So I think, you know, it's been a little bit of a journey for me, but just tuning in to how I feel, how my body feels, how, you know, how much energy I have and what are the practices that help fuel my energy and provide more energy and and energize me versus the things that drain my energy, even if they feel like the thing to do in the moment, like eat chips and watch TV can be very relaxing, right? And maybe if I eat something different than chips, I'll feel a little bit better the next day. I don't know. Those are some ways that I'm, I'm trying to learn how to tune in. I think that that you nailed that piece too. It's it's an individual. Each individual gets to choose. It's understanding agency that you get to choose. And it doesn't have to be that chips and watching a movie is is bad. It's it's just a choice that we're making. And that that choice will then have specific outcomes. It, you know, it's the same thing that we we coach leadership teams with, right? It's, it's a choice. You make the choice and there will be outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so it's really coming home and noticing the same things and just having awareness and know that if it didn't work out the way you wanted, we have the agency to make a different choice. And what works for Nicole's body isn't going to work for Hannah's body all the time. And it's definitely not going to work for Luke's Um, But what it can do is it can weave curiosity. Let me try that. And so many times that curiosity comes from seeing it modeled, right? If I never had that Kripalu experience of, you know, such a radically different way of living, I might not have known that something like that was, was possible or, you know, definitely in the beginning, I thought it was just like going to Disneyland, right? (laughs) It was... It was just so far beyond all of my experiences that I could, you know, have this and have this and and just have little tastes of what wellness looked like all in one weekend. And then, of course, trying to herd all those things and then bring them home. But I had a, a friend that would say, no, 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 don't try and bring them all home. Just pick one little thing each time you go. And integrate it back into your life. Um, but yeah, modeling the way and being curious about practice is always the first step. Yeah. So I think for folks listening, you know, maybe an analogy would be helpful when we ask about, you know, what is embodiment? And I think of it as I want access to all the senses that I have. If I'm going to be as effective as possible, in navigating this world and making an impact. I want to use all the tools at my disposal. And for me, and I'm 
certainly not as far along this journey as either of you two. Um, but I think a lot of my life I live like I'm uh, playing a, let's call it a racing video game. Um, I'm not very good at video games, except for car driving video games, which for whatever reason, I'm good at it, which means I like it. I like doing things I'm good at. But <clears throat> you can see what's on the screen. You can hear the sounds. And then you've got this controller and you can kind of go left or right or, you know, accelerate or brake or whatever. And uh, some remotes or some controllers have haptics built into them. And haptics are basically just like the physical feedback that comes back. So they might vibrate or they might make a sound or they might, you know, provide extra resistance to a joystick or something like that. Some of them don't, though. They have less haptics and you're really just using your eyes and ears to drive this car. So I think about that being a way that I, I've i lived my life a, a long time, really being in my head and just kind of joysticking my body around and being like, well, I've got to go to this class and now I've got to go to, to work and now I've got to go invest in this relationship and now I've got to go do this other thing. Versus if you take that all the way into what I would say an embodied experience is like actually being in a car, a physical car, where you can feel the resistance of the steering wheel and you can see things going past you in 3d and you can feel how the tires are sticking to the pavement or to the gravel differently or whatever it is. You can feel the limits of the accelerator when you punch it down. Um, And for me, like that's what embodiment is, is being able to say, what is my body telling me about what's happening in the world around me? And as I kind of explore that and try and get more and more into actually the driver's seat instead of at a at a joystick or controller, um, I find myself more perceptive to what's happening with other people, um, to what I'm bringing with me, <clears throat> maybe my level of energy for the day, things like that. And I'm able to adjust and modulate better and have a more sustained impact because I just have more data, I have more information that I can react to and make conscious choice around. I don't have a question after that. That's just my thought. Yes. Thank you. It's exactly what it is. And I love the way you articulated that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's get practical. So when we think about being embodied, being connected to ourselves, being in relationship to ourselves so that we can have sustained impact, right? When we, when we think about how do I know it's time to do some sort of self-care exercise, um, but there's some activities I know that you have a list of some applications. So what are some things that we can start doing? Uh, What, what comes to mind first for you? You already demonstrated the Put a hand on the chest, hand on your belly, just check in with your body. But what are some other things that you think are really practical ways for people to start um, noticing where they're at and making conscious choices for self-care? When we used to lead personal renewal groups, um, one of the things we would do is a body scan. And it is, you do it while you're in bed in the morning. So you just are coming into consciousness after hopefully your six to eight hours of rest. And you just start at the top of the head. Again, it's talking about embodiment. And so these are the ways that you begin to attune to those um, tools and messages that your system offers. So just starting at the top of your head while you're lying in bed, And just kind of go through the whole body and notice, allow yourself to feel your cheekbones, feel your tongue in your mouth, feel your jaw, feel your shoulders, come through, notice where your digestion is. How's your digestion first thing in the morning? What about your side body? Just kind of gently moving the side body, going into the hamstrings, the knees. You might want to give your toes a wiggle, noticing your calves, just checking in with the body, Uh, checking in with the liver and the spleen and the kidneys. 
Did they rest along with you? And that's just an easy way. And then your whole body begins to feel alivened because you notice them. Yeah, it's like you're putting conscious attention on the different parts of the body. And by placing your focus and consciousness on that piece of the body, you actually begin to feel it. And and maybe it's, I remember in some of my early yoga classes when they would do, have us do these body scans. And, you know, when you say things like, feel your cheekbones, I'd be like, I can't feel my cheekbones. What do you mean? <laughs> right. But maybe you can feel a tightness in that part of your body and maybe it helps you relax it a little bit, right? Or maybe you notice your scalp, how like do you have tightness, you know, in your forehead or your temples or, you know, and just by placing consciousness, focused attention on an area, we begin to notice it more. Yeah, that's that. interesting because I think most people stretch when they wake up, right? That you move your body, you do things similar physically to what you're saying, but we're just not placing conscious focus on it. We're not really noticing our body's just kind of like, yeah, I got to wake up. Um, it, so why do we stretch? It is to wake up. What if we noticed that while we were doing it? So it's pretty interesting. Okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to try that one. What else? What's another practical way that people can um, notice if they need self-care or check in with their body? I love the idea of microdosing self-care. And a lot of times we talked, we referred earlier in the conversation to, you know, just adding things to the to-do list. If there's a day where you are just full and you need to say your your self-care, your body embodiment practice tells you that you really don't have time to drive into town and take a yoga class. You know, what else could I do in little 15 minute increments? You know, what could I do that would really nourish my sense of well-being? Um, and then you just get creative and you don't tell yourself no. So whatever thought comes to mind, set a timer for 15 minutes and just do it. It might be pulling out um, markers and drawing for a little bit. It might be grabbing your journal and, you know, just asking yourself some quickie journaling questions like, you know, where am I? What is my self-assessment today? On a scale from one to 10, where am I? You know, one being I'm having a really, really tough day. I'm feeling a little bit disempowered and disembodied. And 10 being, hey, I am ready to rock my game. But just giving um, attention to where you are automatically creates the curiosity that, you know, you can be where you are and offer space for it to look different. So in that space of it looking different, you get to create and dream of what it might look like. And can I, you know, have my own back enough to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And then when the timer stops, you know, again, creating trust with yourself, it's only 15 minutes this time. So you can come back to it later, you know, 15 minutes and now I'm ready to work on my project or I'm ready to you know, have that tough conversation that I know I need to have. So So, honest question is 15 minutes required because immediately I just think for myself and I think for especially other folks who kind of they're maybe they're caregivers, they get up, they've got to take care of other people. They go to work, they come home, they take care of people you know, 15 minutes. I'm just like, well, 15 minutes means 15 minutes less sleep. If I've got a you know, set aside that time on many days, right? And maybe I'm not right about that and I'm I'm self-assessing wrong, but that's my, that's my instinctual, like, I don't got 15 minutes to give unless it's 15 minutes less sleep. So is that required? Can it be like 30 seconds? Like what, what, what would you say to people who, 
that feels very expensive to them. Sure. I, and it really is, it's that individual. I would like bow to you and say, Luke, you're asking all the right questions and you can't do a wrong (laughs) self-assessment. If you are being truthful and honest, that is where you are. And so I mean, the baby step might be for 30 seconds. It could be that stretch and check in. No, it doesn't have to be 15 minutes. But the idea is for you to start learning to trust your embodiment. And so if it's for 30 seconds, do that 30 seconds, create a cadence. And maybe you do that 30 seconds 25 times throughout the day. And then you'll notice that when you do the check-in, that your body will start giving you more information. Because you're showing up to hear it, or you're showing up to feel it, or to have that sensing and experience. And so, yeah, it can be, it can be 15, 30 seconds. Um, And the more, the, the beauty in it is that the more we think about giving ourselves that permission, the more information we receive. And so you, it's, it's that you're paying attention to me oh, wow, he is actually listening. So now I feel that I can trust him and give him more information. Or it can be in a way that you might recognize it a little more easily, right? Instead of spending four hours in nature. Not not saying that you shouldn't spend four hours in nature, but when you have that and schedule it, I am the biggest advocate for putting it on your schedule, just like you would put... Um, coffee with a dear friend on your schedule, you would create a time and you would honor that person's time and you wouldn't back out on them. Like, it's okay to do the same thing for yourself, to carve out, you know, a self-care date or a solo date, nature date. Um, You know, I love to dance, sing, connect, and um just really have like enlivening experiences. Um, But if I don't put it on my schedule, somehow someone else's needs pop up and I'm, you know, I just things, or maybe it's that I want to walk the dog and so something happens. So just having a date, like a time slot, just like I would with one of our meetings where it's just for me to check in is, has been beneficial for me. Again, I'm a, I'm that feeler. I'm a <laughs> so having something concrete with a beginning, middle, and end. It's not say, like saying that I'm taking the whole weekend off. It's just I have this time. And at the end of this time, I can choose if I want to extend our date with myself or I can, you know, just put the timer on and, and be done. But those are the ways that create, I think, reminders. That embodiment can be, you know, a natural way of being and receiving that information. But it's a it's a practice. Um, I mean, it starts with choosing a that you are worthy and you are worth uh, taking care of and making a priority, and then making yourself a priority the way you would make a friend or client a priority. And I'm a, I'm a big believer and I haven't been practicing as much of this lately. And so that's a good reminder to me, but to schedule the things that are important for your well-being, that includes time off, vacations, or just time to be in nature or do the things that make you feel like you and actually putting those things on your schedule before you put anything else on. Because if you wait till the schedule fills up, it's full, <laughs> right? And so, yeah, creating some intentional blocks of time. And I think we easily get into this trap of thinking that I there is no time. While we all have the same amount of time and we do have agency, in how we spend that time. Yes, there are people who rely on us who need or demand our time. And unless we make ourselves a priority, nobody else is going to. Like that is intentional leadership. I have to choose 
to make myself a priority because nobody else is coming. Nobody else is going to do that for me. (laughs) I have to lead myself first by choosing that I am a priority. I am worthy. I am important. And if I don't, I'm not going to be able to lead or be available or a resource or be present for the people that need me and rely on me. Yeah, I think that's great. And I'll, you know, as we wrap up here, I think let's do some final takeaways. And for me, what you just said, Hannah, kind of encapsulates it. You know, two things are takeaways for me. One, this is all of our responsibility if we really want to have the most impact and um, leave this world better than we found it as much as possible. Like we have to manage ourselves. We're the only ones with this responsibility to notice how we're doing, make make a choice and care for ourselves. And then the second point is um, not just thinking of this body as like, well, it's a machine. It just does what I tell it to do. It goes where I want it to go. But actually caring for it, giving it the time and space and energy that it requires. So that's mine. Uh, Nicole? What's your takeaway from our conversation? It's always just fascinating to hear other people's experience with it. So I think what I am bringing home is something that I've always known, but that it goes deeper every time we have conversations around this, is that each person gets to choose how they feel well. And it looks different. It can look radically different for each person. And so, you know, Luke, your metaphor was just, it was great. Um, never a way that I have ever experienced self-care in the last 12 years. So I just, I'm so grateful for this conversation and really being able to, you know, dive deeper into the things I'm super passionate about. Anna, how about you? What are you taking away? I think for me, this was just a a good reminder to check in and come back to some practices that I've gotten a little bit away from as life has gotten busy and hectic and intense as it does. And, you know, and, and I think that's part of it is, you know, we, we go through seasons life is a series of seasons, right? It's not a constant and it flows and it changes. And being able to just even here today in this space, having this conversation, I've had a little bit of a sense of arrival and coming back home to myself. And so I just invite everyone who's listening today to Find that space, even if it's just 30 seconds, stop and notice, pay attention on purpose in a particular way without judgment. How am I doing? What do I need right now? What do I want in this moment? And what does my body need and my mind need? And my heart need in order for me to feel whole, to feel at my best. All right. Well, thank you both for a great conversation. Uh, if people are looking for Nicole, this is an easy one. When we say where to find guests, you can find Nicole, the same place you can find Hannah and I, at purposeandperformancegroup.com or magicintheroom.com or any of our social channels. Pretty easy to find out there. Um, You can uh, download the guide for this month around wellness at magicintheroom.com. I think it's valuable for you to do that. Follow along, apply some of these ideas to your own life. If you ever need uh, to connect with someone to help your organization grow, be healthy, uh, please don't hesitate to do that. We would love to Uh, bridge the gap between what science knows about human performance, which is really what we've been talking about today, and bridge the gap with what organizations actually do uh, in in the real world, because 
It is not always optimized. In fact, it usually is not. So we'd love for you to reach out to us. Hannah, you want to read us out? Yeah. Magic in the Room is hosted by Chris Province, Hannah Broderud, and Luke Friedman. It is produced by Ben West. Our social media management is very aptly taken care of by Emma Holland and Maggie King Robinson. Our theme music is by Evan Grimm. You can find his music on Apple Music. This episode was recorded remotely from Oklahoma, Idaho, and California. Thank you for being here today. Magic in in the Room is a production of Purpose and Performance Group. You can find us at purposeandperformancegroup.com and you can find previous episodes at magicinthegroom.com.